Hi. So in this presentation, what we're going to do is review the calculation of damages under the UCC. Remember, the goal of remedies under the UCC is to put the non-breaching party in the same position as it would have been in had the contract not been breached. Thus, the UCC attempts to make the non-breaching party whole, to put them in the place they would have been in had the contract gone through. And it does this in large part by requiring the breaching party to pay money damages. Money damages are the preferred remedy. Now remember, damages are not about punishment. Instead, contract damages are meant to encourage the parties to stick to their contract unless it would be economically efficient to breach. This is called the economic theory of breach, which holds that sometimes a party should breach a contract if it is economically efficient to do so. And as a result of the economic theory of breach, sellers tend to breach in a rising market and buyers breach in a falling market. Breach is part of normal contract interaction. But in order to make it so that we know when it is efficient to breach or not, we need to know how to calculate potential damages for a breach. We'll start with a buyer breach and the calculation of seller's damages. Now, if the buyer breaches and the seller sues to recover damages, money damages, it may recover the difference between the contract price and the fair market price of the goods, plus any incidental damages that we discussed in our other presentation. So let's look at a situation in which the buyer has breached and the seller is attempting to recover damages. So we have a company, Gritty Inc., which contracts to buy a thousand widgets at $10 each from Withers Widgets. Later, Gritty refuses to go through with the purchase. Therefore, Withers then finds a substitute buyer and resells the widgets for $5 each. It cost Withers widgets $200 to find a substitute buyer. Now, in that case, the contract price is $10,000. That's what um, Withers widgets would have received from Gritty Inc. They would have parted with their thousand widgets and they would have received a, a $10,000. The market price is $5,000. Why? Because Withers Widgets is only able to resell the widgets for $5 each. So the actual market price then becomes $5,000. Plus the incidental. Remember, incidental is the cost of mitigation. Withers Widgets has a duty to go find a, another buyer and it costs them $200 to find that substitute buyer. So in this case, the total damages are going to be $5,200. Difference between contract price and market price plus incidental. On your test, you'll probably have a problem similar to this, and it's a pretty straightforward matter to work it out. Let's look at what happens in the case of partial performance. If the buyer has partially performed, how do we calculate the damages for the seller? So in this example, we have a company called Mechanics, which has contracted to buy 600 toolkits at $10 each from Clayton, the manufacturer. Mechanics takes delivery of the first 100 kits, but then refuses to take any more. Clayton is forced to sell the remaining kits for $5 each, and it cost Clayton $500 to eventually find a substitute buyer. Whenever you see those kind of phrases, you know that's incidental damages. So let's look how we calculate this. The contract price is $6,000, meaning at the end of the contract, what Clayton expected to receive was $6,000, in return for these 600 toolkits. The market price, we have to actually look at two numbers. We have to look at what was the price received from the first 100 kits. Well, we sold 100 of them at $10, so that was $1,000, plus $2,500 is what they received from the remainder of 
the sale of the kits, the 500 remaining that were sold at $5 each. Plus the incidental, $500. So in this case, the total damages would be $3,000. Difference between contract price and market price. And market price is going to be composed of the total amount that the seller received after uh, mitigating. And we got to add in the incidental, the $5,000. So in this case, total damages would be $3,000. What about if there's no resale possible? This happens oftentimes in terms of specially manufactured goods where there is no market and therefore it's difficult to set a market price. In this case, we have Pan Am Motors contracts to buy 200 engines at $1,000 each from Scott Manufacturing. Later, Pan Am refuses to go through with the purchase. They breach the contract. Scott spends $5,000 to find another buyer for the engines, but is unable to do so. So in this case, the contract price is $200,000. The incidental damages, which you get to collect even though he was unable to find another buyer. Remember, it's the cost of mitigation. What, how much did you spend in an attempt to reduce your damages? And they spent $5,000. So in this case, the total damages would be $205,000. The full amount of the contract price plus the incidental. So that is calculation of a seller's damages for a buyer's breach. So let's look at a buyer's damages in the case of a seller's breach. So if a seller sues to recover damages, it may recover the difference between the contract price and the fair market price of the goods, subtract any loss avoided by cover. Remember, cover is the purchase of substitute goods. It is how a buyer uh, mitigates damages and then add any incidental damages and any consequential damages that may be available. So let's look at buyer's damages for a seller breach. Here we have Sunrise Flags which is contracted to purchase 100 flags at $15 each from Stripes Inc. Later Stripes fails to deliver the flags. The seller has breached the contract. Sunrise then goes to find substitute flags for $20 each. They cover by purchasing flags for $5 more. We'll pretend for this uh, purpose that, it, that Sunrise did not suffer any consequential damage. It cost Sunrise $500 to find substitute goods. In this case, the market price $2,000 minus the contract price of $1,500, meaning at the end of the day, Sunrise was going to spend $1,500 to get 100 flags. Instead, they had to spend $2,000 to get those same 100 flags. So the difference between the market price and the contract price would be $500, plus the incidental damages, the cost of mitigation, whatever it costs to find substitute goods, the cost of cover. Consequential damages we said are zero and our total damages then are $1,000. $500 difference between contract price and market price plus $500 incidental. Finally, let's look at the buyer's damages for the seller's breach when there has been partial performance. And this gets a little more complicated. Say we have a company, Sports Authority, which is contracted to purchase 500 footballs at $10 each from Rotax. Rotax is going to deliver 200 footballs and then breach. Sports Authority then covers. They go to find substitute goods, and remember they want, they're want still lacking 300 footballs, and they pay $20 a piece for the remaining goods. It costs Sports Authority $500 to find those substitute goods. So in this case, when we calculate market price, we have to look at what did Sports Authority expect to pay for the 500 footballs compared to what they actually paid. So they expected 
to pay $5,000. That was the contract price. For 500 footballs, they would pay $5,000. But the market price, the amount they actually paid, was more. Why is that? Because the market price was, first of all, the $2,000 that they paid for the first 200 footballs, but then the remaining 300 footballs cost them $6,000. So their total market price for those goods was $8,000. So in calculating the damages, we look at the difference between that $8,000 market price and the $5,000 contract price. And then of course we have the cost of mitigation, $500. $8,000 minus $5,000 is $3,000 plus $500 gives us total damages of $3,500. Now to make it a little more complicated, let's look at the possibility of recovery of lost profits. Now the same facts as above, but Rotax knows that Sports Authority expects profits of $10,000. Rotax's partial delivery means that Sports Authority only made half of its usual profit. So when we calculate this final figure, we start with the figure that we got from the last screen, which was $3,500, plus the lost profits. We have to calculate the lost profits, which are, of course, consequential damages. And in this case, it would be one half of $10,000, leaving us with $5,000. So our total damages, if we are going to include consequential damages, is $8,500. As you can see, it went up rapidly once we included consequential damages. And that's why the majority of contracts will limit or exclude consequential damages. Because the amount of consequential damages can increase rapidly. So, contract price minus market price plus incidental plus consequential equals $8,500. That's it. What did we learn today? Well, we know that buyers and sellers have a right to money damages in the event of a breach, that the measure of damage is the non-breaching party's expectation interest. What did the non-breaching party expect to receive out of the contract? And finally, we know that we can calculate damages. On your test, I'm going to give you a little more time in which to uh, take this third test. Uh, simply because I know that uh, throwing math problems into a law test can cause some difficulties and I don't want you to feel like you have to hurry. So you'll have two hours to take this exam instead of the normal 75 minutes. If you have any questions, as always, let me know, email me, call me, um, talk to me in my office. Thank you very much.